traveling around, and as he, uh, you know, managed to take the turns that would lead to his house, he came across or drove next to what we've all seen at one time or another, a bunch of kids around a stand with a sign over it that said, Kool-Aid, 25 cents. Well, intrigued and wanting to help the kids, he he pulled over to the side of the road, rolled down his window, and he said, I will, I'll take a a cup of Kool-Aid. And a little boy ran out and he said, what do you want, sir, grape or strawberry? And he says, well, I'll take grape. And he handed him a dollar. Little boy took the dollar, went back to all the other, all his cohorts, because they had to figure out this change thing and what it meant. You know, the three-year-old whipped out his iPhone and tapped it in, right? Anyway, they, after they got the, the cup of the Kool-Aid and the change, he returned to the car and he gave the Kool-Aid to the man and the man started drinking it and he'd taken his change. But the little boy stayed right next to the window, didn't leave, watched him the whole time. And as he's drinking, he sees the boy there and he finally says, son, why, why are you standing there? Why, what are you waiting for? And the little boy says, I'm waiting for the cup. It's the only one we have. And it's tough to do business with only one cup and you don't have it. (laughs) It's difficult to operate when you only have one cup, nothing more. So then I ask, why do we continue to apply singular or one-dimensional thinking to the challenges we face in a fluid, complex, multi-dimensional society? Why do we seek to put old wine in a new bottle? I was commiserating a few weeks ago with a church member at lunch about the fact that, uh, you know, it seems like it's getting harder and harder for relating. You know, one generation I don't understand, the other generation I don't understand, I look at the world I don't understand. Uh, You know, again and again, it's just more and more difficult to relate which is a real challenge when you're a preacher because week after week, somehow we're expected to relate the gospel to real life, to be relevant in society, to give people something in their suitcase to carry out and to use daily in their world. It's hard to make sense of it, probably because I recognize, like many of you, that the old paradigm, the singular cup we try to use isn't working. And we know we need a new paradigm, a different way of understanding the world, understanding our role and act within it. I mean, who doesn't think there's got to be something different? The problem is we don't know what paradigm to apply. We don't know. We just keep throwing it against the wall. Hopefully something eventually sticks. And some would say, well, you know, the answer, especially regarding the church, is just to hide from the world, to isolate and insulate ourselves from the world. And many places have done that. You know, churches become one-stop shopping centers because then you don't have to deal with society. You can shelter your children all the way through school, but then what happens when they're not in that environment? And other people say, well, just ignore it, just let it go, it'll pass. Maybe we should all get together, form a circle, and sing Kumbaya. But I don't think that's right. And not because I say so, but when I read the Gospels, there's nothing in the Gospels that says we should disengage, ignore, isolate, or insulate ourselves. That Christ and the good news, the message that we are called to apply to all aspects of our life, social, economic, political, all aspects of our lives, isn't about here, it's about going out there. It's about engaging the world, as difficult as it might be. 
And I know that this is a change, and, and <laughs> it really shouldn't be, but this is a change because in our culture, in our society for a long time, especially among mainline denominations, we've taken it all for granted because everyone came to us. Now, they don't even need Sears anymore. Why would they need us, right? Jesus evolves in his ministry. That's a message and a challenge. He evolves from saying in this chapter, I came for the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go to the Gentiles. I came to the lost sheep of Israel. But in the last chapter of Matthew's gospel, he didn't say that anymore. In the last chapter, he says, not come, not stay, not only go to a, a particular group of people, he says, go into all the world indiscriminately go. Don't put limits on the message I have because it is for everyone. That's a different paradigm. A paradigm he was led to regarding change. He didn't say don't run or hide or give up. Don't cry in your milk. Thinking about the old days and the way it was, he says, go, go now, engage. Unless we kind of justify not doing that by saying, well, you know what, those are different times and different places. Those were simpler, less complex times. Well, yeah, in some ways they were. But let me submit to you that in every nation, every time, every age, people are still people. The fundamental thing we are always dealing with is people. You know, my job would be so easy if I didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> right? And people still have the same struggles, the same needs, the same desires, the same wants, as they always have. You know, people are complaining an awful lot these days about all kinds of things, and yet, it seems to me we've forgotten that we live in a country where the rights, liberties, and privileges that are given to us would have been laughable in Jesus' day. They wouldn't even have considered it. Life was cheap. And you didn't try to change things unless you were going to pay the immediate consequences. In fact, the only people who could change things were the ones who possessed either swords or armies. Yet it is into that world that Jesus tells his followers to go. Which is even more counterintuitive today. Think about this. We've built a world where, where going is ridiculous. Everything comes to us. In fact, everything is built around us. Don't you know the greatest power in the world is Amazon? <clears throat> Things come to us. They're at our fingertips with the touch of a phone. We don't have to deal with people. And in not dealing with people, we don't know people. And when you don't know people, it's easy to kill people. Right? When you are disengaged, when you are not connected, when you are isolated, and it's all about you. It is something, this inner relationships, this reaching out, this trying to listen and understand people who have a different perspective. We have lost that. And until we figure out how to regain it, until maybe the church helps us to build those kinds of bridges, it's just going to get worse. It's just going to get worse. You know, I, uh, I've come to the conclusion there are two kinds of people in the world. Do you know what kind of people? Two kinds? Wrong and right? Well, that's a good one, but if everybody's wrong, then nobody's right. Yeah? No, no, there are people who love dogs and there are people who love cats. It's really pretty simple, right? There are people who love dogs and there are people who love cats. Our household happens to belong to the former. We are dog people. <laughs> How many people here are dog people? How many people are cat people? Well, I'm only going to offend a few, so. You know, cats, cats make my eyes water. 
among other things. And maybe that's one of the reasons I, I've never related to them. But the other reason I don't relate to cats is they just think they're cool. You know, cats kind of walk around. They could have sunglasses on. They're just kind of cool. They can, they can take or leave you. And if you want to, you know, pay attention, that's fine. But, you know, I'm, well, I'm a cat. Dogs, on the other hand, they are the neediest things in the whole creation. They come and they lick you and they make you happy and we, you know. In fact, that's, we get that saying, right? It's a dog's life, which means somebody's taking care of you. It's pretty nice. Just kind of lay around, be a floor ornament, and everybody, everybody gets along with you. In fact, we have two dogs in our house, we have one that is living, and then we have one that is... <laughs> Why don't you stand up, Kelly, and tell them about the second dog? I'm talking about midnight. No, well, we have those too, but we have some cremations that are <laughs> in our house too. <laughs> No, I'm talking about this. I don't know what it's made of. We have a dog. What, Katie? It's creepy. It's creepy. <laughs> we have a dog. There's a long story. I won't, I won't say it, but it's not real. And it just kind of sits there, and it looks nice, and people will ask why it's there. And Anyway, and then we have a live dog. So we say it's a dog's life, thinking, you know, you're just kind of around and everybody appreciates you and loves you for that. But the reality is where I'm going with all this is the serious part. Why you connect with these things, why a dog may mean so much to you, is not that, that it lays around, but that it, 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 it relates to you. That there's a connection. That there's a, a love affair that takes place whether they fetch or whether they lick you or whether they just pay attention when you come home. The value of the animal is in the relationship. The relationship changes everything. But relationships require work. They involve effort. If you treat a dog poorly, it'll react that way. If you berate it, it will become aggressive or violent. But if you nurture and you care for it and you love it, you will have a relationship, they say, that will make you live longer, right? Maybe this is why Jesus told us to go. It's a simple fact built into creation that when we are in relationship with other people, it changes. When we give... At the end of the passage says, you know, as you was received generously, give generously. There is, if you want it, you have to give it. You have to go out. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges we face as people of faith. We cannot isolate or insulate ourselves. The change in the world must be the change in how we see the world and how we connect with the world and how we try to build relationships outside our particular world because many of those people, you know, the one thing I just read, all these violent shootings have in common is the shooter almost always comes from a household where there's been domestic violence. So you can deal with a shooter all you want, but if you don't build a relationship that changes the paradigm in which that person has grown up or that person has lived, you're just trying to, what's the saying? Um, do the same thing and get a different result. You know, nobody can live peaceful if they don't know what it's like to live peacefully. And you can't change people through legislations or laws. You change people in their hearts when you connect with them and they look at you and they say, I want what you have. Never seen it before. I want what you have. I do not believe that we conquer the division or lessen the violence or overcome the distrust that exists in our society and world today without a change in our common values and personal interactions. And you can't make that happen without person-to-person -person stuff. You know, Glenn Beck, 
Uh, I read an article on Glenn Beck, and he's been on conservative radio for a long time, and he has changed his tune. He's now going around the country with a very liberal person speaking together, and the last quote I saw of him, he said, you know, I have to take responsibility for a lot of the anger that's in society today. You see, when you enter into relationships, you find out that people are people, and God wants us to love them all. It was G.K. Chesterton, a minister of a past age, who said that it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting. It's that Christianity over the years has been tried and found difficult, and therefore it's never really been tried at all. You know, we didn't get to where we are overnight, and we won't change our attitudes and lessen what's going on overnight either. It will take generations to do. But it's got to start sometime, if not for us, for our grandchildren and our grandchildren's children. Because if we don't, if we don't seek to create that new environment and live by a different paradigm, then we will just be like those little kids reusing the same cup over and over and over, passing the germs of one generation to the next. You can't do different business by using the same old stuff. I fear we're trying to do that. And the question is, how well is that working? Amen.